talk about this four terminal transistors um, you know always remember the principle behind it why are we trying to do this four, four terminal transistors right why do you think we are trying to do a four terminal transistor or a three terminal device what is the need for it what couldn't we achieve through just a simple rlc that or rlc diode that we are trying to do this um, what's what's the basic purpose for doing these devices so control. from a, let's say from a digital so let's control. start yeah so go ahead Rusubham. what what are you saying uh, it's a voltage control switch voltage control switch right so because you know in digital you, in logic your abstractions are zero and one right but in reality there is no zero and one you have a circuit with a power supply and a ground so you're basically trying to create two switches right where if you want one you connect it to vdd you could connect it to ground too i mean that's just an arbitrary thing but just makes more intuitive intuitive sense to do it to vdd and then um, um if you want zero you short it to ground right so that's the digital abstraction is that you need a switch it doesn't have to be a voltage control switch by the way like first guys that they were trying to do a voltage control switch but they accidentally came up with bjt right which is actually a current control switch right so most of your digital was actually current control switch but the key is that you need a control terminal to control the resistance right so it's a voltage control resistor in case of a mos it's a voltage control resistor where you're making a small resistor between vdd to you and output or a small resistor between uh, output to ground to represent a zero right so that's a uh, key element uh, that's a key uh, motivation for doing this three three terminal device from a digital circuit point of view and the analog i kind of you know, sort of told you just a while ago is the amplification. So where you're looking for a transconduction element. So that way it allows you to do power amplification. So that's the key requirement from, from an analog perspective, but also, you know, you use it for other things. You use it for varactors like voltage control capacitors. You know, you use it as um, voltage control resistors, just pure linear resistors, right? Uh, and we'll see that in a while. So that's that's the key key motivation behind uh, this device. Okay, so quickly uh, talk about the band diagram. Uh, so just remember the band diagram is a very, um, you know, it's a it's an abstraction to basically show uh, electron transport or hole transport in a material. Basically it tells you how the electrons or holes are going to move given an electric field or a, you know, given another force, electric force, how are they going to move? Basically, you know, kind of a very uh, crude way of putting what's a band gap. I mean, what's a band diagram? Maybe one day we'll actually take the, uh, because it's actually easy to, not easy, but it's uh, pretty easy to see how from quantum mechanics you are getting here. And that's, that's actually a good way to look at it because sometimes people don't understand where this is coming from. It's a combination of quantum mechanics and statistical mechanics, right? So, uh, but, it's good to know because a lot of times it's easier to explain a device through a band diagram rather than through just pure charges and voltages and electric fields. You know, for example, like, uh, I don't know if you've heard about hemped transistors. Uh, th these, are, uh, these are engineered transistors. So you put different um, epitaxial layers to create this high speed and high current drawing transistors. So a lot of your power amplifiers have that. Uh, and those were actually engineered by looking at band diagrams. If you didn't look at band diagrams, it'll be very difficult for you to come up with those kind of devices, right? So it's always good to know. And the band diagrams is basically telling you the allowable energy states for electrons. In other words, it's just saying, what are the allowable energy and where are they? You know, typically where are they? So for example, the Fermi level. So that, uh, um, three of the most important ones are the valence band, the conduction band and the Fermi level, right? So the valence band is telling you all the states which are available when there is no electrons conducting at all, right? All of them are bound to that level. Those are called the valence band. Uh, conduction band tells you these are the available states. And if any of the electrons occupy this one, they'll start moving. You apply electric field, they'll start moving. And then this is the forbidden zone where in a semiconductor, okay? 
in a conductor there is no region like this but in a semiconductor you have a forbidden zone where uh, the electrons or hole cannot occupy it right that's the quantum phenomena basically but you can see the fermi level is actually a level below this that's because it's a probability it's just basically saying you what's the probability of 50% of an electron occupying that. So it's a statistical thing which tells you the nature of the device. And that's what we use when we are doping it, right? Just trying to figure out if this level, this probabilistic level is closer to EC, then it's the N type. If it is closer to uh, EV, then it's a P type, right? So that's how we. So, so quick um, band diagram sir, of. Uh, yeah, go ahead, Subham. Uh, sir, if we keep on doping, yeah. Then our formula will go above conduction band. No, no, no. So, okay. So here it was. So Subham's question is, if we keep doping, the Fermi level will cross the EC and then maybe it will just shoot off somewhere or something. No, no, no. So uh, once you get very close to EC, so there is, I think I have those doping numbers. Uh, maybe thought I had those numbers. Do you know those doping numbers where the yes, sir, semiconductor is not a degenerate device? I, I wrote those a lot when I was doing, but I, I think it's 10 to the power, what, for uh, eh? 13, no, no, 13 is, I think the- so 10 to the 15 is the normal, and if you go 10 to yeah, the- 15 20. is the normal, so I think it's 18. Let me see if I'm, I might have a note somewhere. Yeah, I don't have a note. Uh, I think I, I, yeah, so just, just look into some of the text. So I think it's about 10, 18 or 20. So once you get to doping levels of atoms, 10 to the power 20 or 18, whatever that number is uh, per centimeter cube, then it becomes what's called a degenerate device. Then the whole band gaps falls apart. You can't apply it. Okay. Sir, so, and then the silicon will be as polysilicon. Say that again. Polysilicon. Sorry. See, he's talking. Sorry. So um, one second. Right, right. Yeah, I, I wrote the numbers a lot of times. I think when we were doing uh, Puneet's lecture, I forget the number. I think it's 18 or, sorry, go ahead, uh, Subham. What are you saying? Sir, uh, then the polysilicon is a degenerative silicon. So polysilicon is a degenerative when it is first an, uh, bombarded with ions, but after it is annealed, it is actually pretty close to a metal, okay? which is kind of, you can actually consider it as a degenerate uh, material. So degenerate doesn't mean that it is useless. Like the name suggests degenerate, you, you're outcast, you know, get out of here. But it's a good metal, you know, conduct. It just, you can apply like the semiconductor theory to calculate uh, holes and transition pairs and all those things, right? The normal semiconductor stuff you can't do. But yeah, if it is degenerate, it's still a good conductor. If it is if it is not fractured. So like in polysilicon, what happens is, you know, you basically uh, uh, define your uh, source and drain areas, right? So you, you put your polysilicon and then you start bombarding them with N plus. And then when you do that, the polysilicon also gets bombarded and that's when it's fractured, okay? All the lattice is fractured. If you take that and apply a voltage, you'll hardly have any current. The resistance is very high. But then what they do is they heat it, right? So they basically heat it to a very high temperature. And then what happens is then it becomes a polycrystalline structure and then it becomes a conductor. Okay? Yes, sir. All right. So, and I think these, uh, can I just go ahead with this? So basically everyone knows, right? How to dope them gets the conduct, formula level gets closer to the EC, uh, becomes a more type of N type, right? And if it is, uh, if you take it uh, three um, compound uh, from the periodic table, then you have more holes, then you have um, the Fermi level closer to the valence band, then it's more of a P-type. So basically your conduction is happening in holes. So if your Fermi level is closer to EV, then the conduction is happening through holes. Whereas if your uh, Fermi level is closer to the EC, then your conduction is happening through electrons. Okay, that's all it means. Uh, well, not that's all it means, but there's more to it, but that's all I guess we... And yeah, so now if you take the band uh, diagram and try to... Uh, ca categorize uh, types of materials. So the first one is the insulator where you have uh, uh, basically all your electrons in your valence band. You typically cannot, or cannot, in an ideal insulator, you don't have anything in the conduction band. 
and the band gap, the forbidden gap is huge, right? So some uh, like silicon dioxide, I think is what 18 electron volts, 18 electron volt is huge. You have to give a lot of energy. And once you give that much energy, the oxide breaks down, right? It just breaks down and yeah, it conducts, but it breaks down and you can't reverse it. Most of the time you can't reverse it. And then the conductor one, obviously they're kind of overlapped. So, because you always have mobile carriers, even at room temperature. And semiconductor is somewhere in between. And uh, obviously you have a forbidden uh, gap or a band gap, but at room temperature, you always have few amount of electrons which can have enough energy to jump, right? So you have a little bit of uh, conduction going on. And uh, as your temperature increases, the number of electron going to the conduction band also will increase. So in your circuits, you'll see uh, when you are doing simulations, you should check like your uh, leakage currents for your reverse bias diodes or drain to source. You plot it with temperature, you'll see that it just goes up. And by the time you get to like 85, 120, it just kind of exponentially goes up. Okay. So your leakage current at high temperature is a big problem in ICs. You know, that's one of the reasons, one of the main problems with uh, processors now for low power because uh, for uh, low uh, small channel length, your um, the leakages are very high because your drain and source now they're so close by, they, they, the the electrons start shooting through. Okay, and we'll talk a little bit about it. Okay, so that's how you do uh, it. So is, yeah, so you keep the trap trap sub threshold current. No, no, that's not sub threshold current. So that's we'll we'll come to that. Okay. All right. So quick um, PN junction, I think again, um, so you dope one side with acceptors, one side with, uh, okay, so this is, uh, I think, a point. So, so typically when you're doing a PN junction, so this is a typical number you uh, make an type, 10 to the power 18 is very close to degenerate, okay? And I think if you get to 19 or 20, then it's completely degenerate. So this is almost looking like a metal, okay? And then if you have that PN junction, like we've seen that before, we have um, uh, electrons which have, uh, so, you know, higher energy across the barrier. So they start flowing to the opposite side. And every time an electron flows to the opposite side, it leaves a fixed charge, right? Because it's leaving a fixed charge behind because it's not charge neutral anymore. If it is leaving a fixed charge anymore, then you have a small electric field. And if you have a small electric field in this direction, you have a potential acting in the other direction because it's the derivative of negative derivative of the field, right? So, and so obviously as it is building up, the potential is building up and then, so they're up, you know, working in opposite direction and then they reach a point where the electric field is high enough that the electrons don't have the potential to go over. So the potential barrier is exactly equal to the electric field uh, or the derivative of the electric field. So the negative potential because of the electric field is exactly the same as the built-in potential and they just cancel, right? And uh, that's when everything stops. And when it stops, basically you have a depleted area with positive fixed charges in this side. You have a depleted area with negative charges on this side, right? So, and if you look at it from a band diagram point of view, uh, you know, obviously uh, everything from here to here looks like a normal P-type. So you have the Fermi level close to the valence band. Everything from, uh, sorry, here to this side, uh, the Fermi level is close to the conduction band because it's N type. Now, thermodynamics says that when you join them together, this Fermi level still has to be the same. You cannot have a jump in Fermi level. That's the thermo thermodynamics in equilibrium if you don't have a field or your temperature is not varying or anything. So when it is in equilibrium, temperature and field wise, when it is in equilibrium, then, then this has to be, uh, yeah. so if this has to be contact, then the thing has to bend, right? So the both the conduction band and the valence band has to bend. So this is the band bending we talk about. And this is that potential difference basically, because the band diagram is nothing but the potential of electrons. So if there is, if the potential is changing, then that's the difference in the potential going from one region to another region, right? So that's the <coughs> potential difference. And if you calculate the charge, again, you can calculate the charge based on how much doping per centimeter cube and what is the distance it has uh, depleted, right? That leaves your total positive charge and negative charge. 
And if you look at the electric field, like I just said, the electric field obviously is zero from here to here, from here to here. And then as it is proceeding, because the number of charges are increasing, so the electric field is actually increasing and it's a peak here, obviously, because after this, the electric field starts um, getting terminated in each of these negative charges till it reaches the other side of the depletion, right? And then you get a the maximum peak at this point, right? And the, so that's your electric field. And then um, <clears throat> if you want to calculate that depletion charge here, um, you know, won't go into the detail, but basically you apply Gauss's law with the Poisson equation, which basically tells you the potential square. Um, that's, uh, let me just bring that equa equation here. Yeah, so that's the, well, I haven't written the Poisson equation here, but if you apply the Poisson equation, you're gonna get the um, difference between the two potential at both the ends. And that actually gives you the total depletion charge the distance of the depletion because you know um, the doping constant of it and that allows you to uh, so we are doing all this for two main reasons one is to calculate the junction capacitance and the second thing is when we are doing going to do vt calculations we use this in the vt calculation because the bulk charge which just right before the inversion uh, the amount of voltage needed is decided by this depletion charge, right? So that's why you do this calculation. So, you, you know, just go through this calculation to know it, but at least know the principle behind it, how it is coming. And then when we do the, the calculations, it will be more clear. So like I just said, you, from, from these equations, you can find out the depletion length, right? On the N side and the P side. And that helps you with the capacitance calculation as well as VT calculation. And uh, obviously the, the, the calculation for uh, the depletion charge as well, okay? So in this uh, PN junction uh, can be forward biased and reverse biased, right? So actually the forward bias is not very interesting for IC designers because typically you're never forward biasing it, but you're always reverse biasing it, right? Every source and drain is a reverse bias diode. So if you have million transistors, you have 2 million reverse bias uh, source and drains plus the bulk if your bulk is connected to something else, right? So, so the forward, you know, I'll not uh, that I think everyone knows it's exponential once you forward bias it specifically after, um, you know, 0.5. And uh, the mode of transport is both drift and diffusion in diode, okay? So, because you have it, because if you inject a charge in any of them, the way it recombines, that's diffusion. But if you just put isolated charge and put electric field, then it'll drift, right? And both the mechanisms are there, right? Whereas in a MOS, the channel is primarily drift, okay? Uh, unless it's in subthreshold, okay? We'll talk a little bit about it. In subthreshold, it's purely diffusion, right? So in MOS, actually, it's both um, drift and diffusion as well. But the diffusion part is tiny, tiny compared to the drift. That's why we always approximate with this, but your models, like your BC models, it'll have everything in it, okay? So like I said, reverse bias is uh, more, uh, uh, I shouldn't say interesting, but it's because it's a parasitic diode, but that's something at least you should know where the capacitance is coming from. So, you know, if you have a reverse bias diode, there is already a built-in junction formed with a depletion and the depletion kind of looks like a dielectric, right? The reason it looks like a dielectric because there cannot be any charge inside it, but there is an electric field inside it, right? So it kind of looks like a dielectric because if it is a conductor, if you have electric field, then there will be current through it. If there's a semiconductor, then you have electric field, there will be a current to it. But in a insulator, you can have electric field, but no current, right? So it looks like an insulator basically. Now, what happens if you increase this voltage a little bit, this uh, charge will, increase on both sides, right? By how much amount? And that's if you calculate that delta Q and divide it by delta V, that's your incremental capacitance, right? Of uh, the uh, this reverse bias diode. Because um, when you're looking at it from a two port element, they don't know what there is inside. You just apply a delta V, delta Q is taken away from your voltage source and you say, okay, it looks like a cap which is delta Q by delta C, right? But the thing is that now you apply another delta V, the delta Q is going to be different now, unlike a oxide cap, right? 
that's because it's it's voltage dependent because as your voltage is increasing this distance is also increasing right this is looking like your oxide but in a normal cap that's not the case right you have two parallel capacitors and this xn is always fixed so it's not voltage dependent right so you apply a delta v the amount of delta q is taken you apply another delta v same delta q you apply another delta v same delta q till you break it down right so if you have a 5 volt capacitor from 0 to 5 it will still look like c till you get to 5 then it will break down and then obviously it's not a capacitor anymore but in this one it's voltage dependent and because it's voltage dependent it's nonlinear right and the way you find out nonlinear is because you can apply oh, superposition and it will not you know um obey superposition basically okay so the calculation is pretty simple you have already derived the equation how to calculate the amount of delta charge and what is the distance of that depletion right so basically that's what you do here you find out what is the delta q and you find out what that depletion length is and and the the permittivity is like the permittivity of silicon inside it that kind of gives you the equivalent cap. So you do some math where basically this delta Q by delta V, you uh, divide it by delta Xn and multiply it by delta Xn. Then it basically breaks down, decomposes to into these two equations. And then if you take the limit to zero, then it becomes this derivative, right? And then you already have derived a Q with respect to Xn, like in the previous equation. And, what you, and you have an expression for Xn uh, which is uh, as a function of phi naught. Now, instead of phi naught, you apply phi naught plus the reverse voltage, right? So, and then you uh, do a derivative with respect to VR and you'll get this term as well, right? So basically, if I go back to the previous equation, I mean here, so basically here you have a QB as a function of Xn. So if you do DQ, BN, uh, D by DXn of this one, it's just Q times ND, right? And then you have a Xn as a function of this reverse bias potential, but now it's going to be phi plus the reverse bias voltage, right? And then you basically take a d, dv, d derivative with respect to Vr, and then you have that other equation, right? Okay, so you do all that math uh, jumbo mumbo and you'll basically get a equation of this form right so instead of cj being a fixed value cj naught you basically get this plus this nonlinear term here which is a function of square root of vr right so that's why it's nonlinear okay so remember um, so at least you know know the principle behind it somebody asks you why is it nonlinear what should be your answer because in one word huh? Yeah, that's true, but physically, like what is the physics behind it being nonlinear? So first you have to tell like it's voltage dependent. That's why because if they ask you if voltage is dependent, why is it nonlinear? Because you'll say you can apply superposition, it will not. Okay. Then if physically they allow ask you like, why is it? Then basically you say the distance between the plates is changing as a function of voltage. That's what makes it nonlinear. Okay. So that's the key. So this one here, right? As your charge is uh, increasing, the distance is also increasing, which is not true in a parallel plate cap, right? Parallel plate cap, it's just a sheet charge and the charge just keeps increasing, but the distance still remains the same. Okay, qu quickly, uh, contact potential. If it confuses you, don't worry about it. It confuses everyone. Uh, but, um, you know, it's essentially the built-in potential like PN junction. So if you took the PN junction, the contact potential also will be the built-in potential. So you can just imagine. But the way it is defined is actually the work function of the two. So if you have two materials, you bring them close, what you get is what's called a contact potential. So you can imagine it's like almost like a voltage source, but if you apply a voltmeter, you'll get zero volt. You won't get the contact potential. That's because I'll, I'll explain that in the next slide because it always cancels out because of this reason is that if you stack a bunch of material, okay, from some material M1, M2, M3, Mn, and it has all different work functions, phi1, phi2, phi3, phi1, then you look at the work function at the very end, it is the work function of the two end elements. Everything inside gets canceled. Now, if you put it two probes, the same thing happens because those two probes are two materials on both ends, and they cancel at the very end because the work function of these two probes is zero, basically, right? 
So they basically just cancel out. So uh, because the work functions are same. So that's why you can't measure them, but it is the physical value, which is there, which you use it to calculate all your VT and everything, right? So that's the, so that's the key thing you have to remember about contact potential is that if you have a stack of material, it's the two end material, which counts. Everything inside, you don't care about it. They just keep canceling. So basically it becomes phi one minus phi two, but the next one becomes minus phi two plus phi three. The next one becomes minus phi three plus phi four. So all those ones cancel, right? All right, yeah. so now we'll uh, go into calculating the threshold voltage and I'll show you the threshold voltage calculation from a charge perspective, from a voltage perspective and a band gap. So that way, hopefully it will give you, you know, all sorts of uh, views, but any questions so far or you have any? Everything makes sense so far. Sir. Yeah. Sorry, if the right, so. function. Sorry, Subham, you got cut off. I can't hear you anymore. Uh, sir, if there is a function difference, yeah. uh, then there should be diffusion. Okay, so the question is. Um, the, he's saying there is a work function difference. There should be a diff diffusion. Remember, the work function difference is between these two points. So you're finding out the work function between these two points. It's not like there is a voltage difference between this and there will be a diffusion, right? Because there's no current to flow. So the work function is basically the work function difference between these two points. You got it, right? No, sir. So the work function is the uh, energy required to move an uh, electron from formidable to uh, free space. Right. Uh, then sir, so how, how it is becoming for one point? How is it becoming what? For one point where founding the contact potential. So just remember that. So if you're getting confused, it is just like P type N type. If you just took this P type N type, right? We didn't talk about work function there, right? Because see, the reason for contact potential, they talk about work function instead of Fermi level, because this could be just a metal, right? There sir, you don't have a Fermi level. Sir, in PN level, we have a diffusion region, so current can't flow. So uh, that generates a work function. I, uh, that generates a work function difference. No, 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 work function is a property of a material. It is not being generated by anything. So you have to be clear about that first, okay? So work function is a property of a material. And if you take P and N, the work function difference is the same as phi BI, the one which we calculated, got it? The reason is in semiconductor, you can reference everything to the Fermi level because you have one. I mean, Fermi level in the sense with reference to the conduction band and the, um, the valence band. But these two material can be anything, right? So that's why they're referred to the work function. So if you have a work function difference, then the contact potential is the difference between the work function. Are you asking why is it the difference between work function? I, I, I guess I still didn't get the question. What are you asking? What's your question? Sir, I am saying that if there is a work function and the metals are conducting, so yeah. uh, diffusion current, uh, so there no, will no, be no. diffusion they, of charge carriers. No, there won't be any diffusion. It'll just be, so if this was a metal and this was a P-type, there will just be a barrier here, that's all. Yes, you'll initially get, but that in equilibrium, there cannot be any current, right? Where will the current flow? Where is the current flowing? Where is the circuit? Subham, where is the circuit? Uh, sir, if we put two metals, then uh, how will- Subham, I'm just asking a simple question. Where is the circuit? No, sir, it will violate KCL. What's that? Sir, um, it will violate KCL. There is no circuit, right? So where is the current going to flow? Where, where is your current flowing from where to where? From P to N, there is no circuit. You have to close it, right? So where is the current? Okay. So the difference in potential will just appear as a difference in potential as a contact potential, right? And that's what I was trying to say that if you take the input, so basically the question you should be asking is you have a contact potential. Now, if I put a wire, is there going to be a current? No, because now if you take the contact potential, just break the wire, the work function difference is phi m minus phi m, which is zero. You got it, right? So if I, if I take now a metal, put it here. So this is a metal and I put another metal here and join it by a wire. Now, is there a current going to flow? That's the question you should be asking. 
And the answer is no, because now the contact potential here is zero because it's phi m minus phi m because it's always the very two end materials, right? Okay. Yes, sir. All right. So, you know, just remember that right now, just, you know, just uh, maybe just study a little bit more. I mean, if you go deep into this, we'll get lost right now. Okay. So threshold voltage. Okay. So any, any other questions? Clear everyone? Okay. So like I said, we'll just quickly look at the threshold voltage, um, MOS threshold voltage, how to derive it, but mostly trying to figure out, you know, what is, you know, how's the threshold voltage coming into picture. So <clears throat> if you take the metal oxide and here we're going to take a sandwich of a P type uh, with oxide in between and a metal, and that metal could be a degenerate polysilicon, right? So it could be just a P plus or a N plus polysilicon, right? And then we apply a voltage across the, the, the two ends of this uh, sandwich. Um, <clears throat> when you do that, what happens is um, because there is a potential difference, so I can you know, apply KVL across this loop here, right? So you have VG, then you're going to have some voltage across this oxide. And that voltage across this oxide is nothing but uh, the electric field times the distance, right? And the way it appears is because you have a vol uh, voltage source, you have charges here. So those charges will come here. And then the negative charges appear over here where the positive, uh, I mean, the fixed negative charges appear here because the positive charges have pushed out, right? And that's your depletion region here. And so this electric field goes and they get um, terminated in this um, electron. Now, if you look at it from a voltage perspective, so if you just plot it in a single dimension and you look at the voltage, right? So your voltage, basically, this is with respect to this node, let's say. I'm plotting this voltage with respect to this node. So you can assume this is your ground, right? So this node is obviously VG. Uh, VG1 in the sense I'm saying that I have applied VG1. This battery voltage is VG1, right? So this is VG. And um, here at this point, it is zero, right? Because there is no current flowing in this uh, region. So that means if this is zero volts, then this is also zero volts. So then that voltage is going to turn to zero here, okay? And because this is oxide, this is linear, right? Because this is minus dV by dx is this electric field, right? Which is V, v over the distance, total distance, because it's a linear field, right? But this one is follows that PN junction equation, right? It's that depletion equation we derived that follows this one. You remember we did the Poisson equation and all that to derive the charge uh, equation and the potential and all that. So that dis decides this. Now the key thing is this potential right here, okay? At the interface, okay? So that potential is, um, so the, the VT definition is when that potential is high enough that this channel inverts and you have, so for example, we have taken P type. So the majority carrier is what holds. Now, if the majority carrier at that interface becomes electrons, that means it is inverted, right? And that's the definition of the VT. So the definition of VT is, um, so yeah, so you keep increasing it and, I'm, and I plotted the phi S, which is the potential of this channel with respect to over here. So that's slowly increasing as you're increasing VG, right? And I have, noted this point to Ff, that's the potential once you reach there. And you know when I show the band diagram, it will be more clear why to Ff. Once you reach that point, then the channel inverts, okay? And then you have a carrier, uh, negative carrier in that channel and you apply electric field, uh, then it can flow, right? Uh, and I'll mention about subthreshold current, Subham just asked about. So this is actually approximation. Uh, approximation in the sense you have a little bit of carrier is being formed. It's not like at 2 Fef the whole thing comes up. Plus you have diffusion, right? Because you have um, uh, de depletion mode uh, carriers there, fixed carriers. So you can apply a delta V and there will be uh, current flowing through it in a uh, using diffusion, right? Not just drift. And that's the subthreshold current. I'll explain a little bit of that. But the definition of VT is you just keep increasing that. And once it reaches that value of, um, so yeah, so basically I'm just saying that this gate voltage is 
uh, if you apply KVL, then it is the potential, whatever is dropping across the oxide, plus this voltage, which is phi s, right? And this phi s can be calculated again using the PN junction because we calculated the depletion charge based on the potential, right? So it's the same equation you use here, assuming the other side is at least as if it's a metal. So it's like a one-sided junction. If you do that, you can actually apply the same thing. And the definition of uh, uh, the, the threshold voltage is the gate voltage VTN, where the surface potential is equal to this 2VF, right? And 2VF is that, um, you know, the um, thermal voltage times the ratio of uh, NA over ND. That's your uh, to VF different difference. And what is this? Uh, what is this voltage Vox? And that's the that is the voltage right before your channel inverts the charge at this plate, right? Divided by voltage, right? That's your that's your uh, capacitance. Uh, I mean the capacitance. Uh, divided by Q is one over V of this this value here. But I don't know what this charge is, right? But I know how to find this charge using my PN junction theory. So that's why you can find out by finding out how much depletion charge was there because right before the channel inverts, that was the same amount of charge should be here too, right? Because charge has to be conserved. So whatever is in the depletion, because it hasn't inverted yet, right? So whatever charge is in the depletion has to be on this plate. So whatever charge was taken from the battery divided by the Cox will be the voltage across it, right? Because it's a linear cap, linear oxide cap. And this I have calculated from my PN junction theory. So I can substitute that. And then plus two VF is going to give me that VT value, right? But this is the, what's called the ideal VT value. Now the reason it's called ideal VT value is because I haven't taken care of contact potential. Now, if you, doesn't make contact potential, doesn't make sense here. Don't don't worry about it. I'll explain it in another way. I think it might become clear. But essentially what it is, is that you assumed that there was no potential difference to begin with in that previous equation. But we, we've seen that if you take a stack of material, there is a potential difference, which is the work function difference between the gate and the substrate here, right? And that's what's called a flat band voltage. So the reason it's called the flat band voltage because, and it'll, It'll be clear when I show you the, the band diagram, but basically it's the voltage you apply to bring it to a condition as if all the bands are flat, like as if these three elements were separate, they weren't joined together, right? So, and, and there was no band bending. Like for example, in a PN junction, you remember, right? The bands are flat, I joined them and the bands bend because the Fermi level has to be same and the ECV values were different, right? So there the flat band voltage would be the inbuilt voltage, right? Because there I apply the voltage to cock it back to 5B and that's the forward forward current equation, right? After that, then the current starts speeding up. Before that, I'm just trying to balance it, right? Otherwise the, the current should have started right at zero volt, right? So that's like, imagine this is the built-in voltage, voltage of your PN junction, but instead of a PN junction, now you have metal oxide and this thing, but we saw previously that doesn't matter what the materials are, you can have a stack of 300 materials, but in the end, the work function difference between those two end materials, I'm going to see a potential difference. So I have to first undo it, okay, cock it back, and then apply those to uh, the Vox and the 2VF, that will invert it, right? So if I, uh, and that's the uh, equation for the flat band voltage, for N plus poly, uh, polysilicon and um, a typically doped uh, P substrate. Uh, so now if you look at the VT equation, it's basically previously we derived these two, right? And this was your QB, right? Your uh, And this is obviously the two fee, that's the definition, right? That's the definition of VT. Now you have to add this flat blind voltage, okay? So if you do that, then that'll tell you what your, uh, this thing is. So one example here, so, 3.45 femtofarad per micrometer square. I think that's like a 0 0.18, uh, 180 nanometer uh, process. And that's roughly the femtofarad per micrometer square. And you take, uh, um, and you can see this is a normally doped uh, P substrate and this is heavily doped the polysilicon. It almost looks like a metal. And uh, if you take these two and you calculate VTN, you see the VTN is negative minus 0.25. What does it mean? It's, it's normally on, right, exactly. 
So that means the channel is already formed even if you don't apply a voltage, right? So you can just apply a voltage across the two terminals, not the gate and source, but on the two sides of the thing, and there will be current flowing through it, right? Uh, so this is what's called a depletion mode device. So depletion mode device in the sense that the channel is already formed. If you want to take the channel away, you apply a negative voltage and then that will turn the channel off, right? So there are depletion mode devices also if you want to operate it that way, okay? So, but typically we want enhanced mode devices for NMOS, right? Because the NMOS is a ground referred device. So we want enhancement mode in the sense we want a positive VT because we want to switch it on when we give a positive voltage because it's, it's easier to operate it that way. Otherwise, you know, you have to push the, uh, NMOS to the top, PMOS to the bottom, then, you know, the strong zero, strong one effect will be there because one won't pass a good zero, the other one won't pass, uh, pass a good VDD and so on. So for this device, it's it's uh, uh, better to have a positive device. So in order to do that, what you do is you basically implant, uh, deliberately implant a charge layer underneath the oxide layer. So what that will do is it will basically now on top of whatever the voltage you applied, which is a negative voltage, you apply a positive voltage to undo this, right? Because what you've done is you've put some charge underneath it. So you basically do that to undo it. So that's the next term. So, you know, we got like what, minus 0.25 volts here, right? So let's say I want to make a VT of points, um, 0.5 volts, let's say, right? So what should be this voltage? 0.75, right? So if I make this 0.75, then the total VT would be 0.5 volts, right? So Q is obviously, that's just a physical parameter. C ox for a given technology is known like 3.35 femtofarad per micrometer square. So I can't change that. So what you do is you basically change this doping. So the higher voltage you want, you make the, the implant higher and higher, which is the negative implant for this is higher and higher, ion implants. And these are fixed implants, so they're, they're not moving. So it's not like they're implants so that they apply voltage and they start conducting the current because then it's not going to help you, right? So they have to be fixed, immobile. So they're not moving, but they change your VT. That's the key, right? So you want to change your VT to it. Um, so I do done one calculation. So I took 0.5 here. We are doing a calculation of, uh, if I want an effective voltage of 0.678. So let's say 1.7 then you basically boom, uh, ion implant this density, two into 10 to the power 12 per centimeter square because we are taking charge density because the depth is fixed basically. You do that and then you get uh, the, the voltage required to undo this is about 0.928 volts and previously it was minus 0.25. So that'll give you an effective VT of 0.678. So this makes sense, right? So, so the complete equation now is the flat band voltage, which is basically undoing the contact potential. Uh, this is the depletion charge, which is formed right before you turn the channel on. And this is the surface potential, which needs, which you require to turn the channel on. And you know, when I explain it through the band diagram, I think it'll make uh, sense. And this is the engineered one. So this is where you're controlling. So that's the only control you have. So you're controlling this implant to do it. And then on top of that, you have some impurities too. Like the oxide, we assume that is a pure oxide, but it's never a pure oxide. Every time the oxide is formed, some charge gets trapped in it. So if there's some negative charge trapped in it, then you have to give that much positive charges on the gate to first cancel it before your electric field can go through the oxide all the way to the channel. Okay, so that's the, and that amount is obviously Q impure by Cox. That's a, um, it's a, you know, approximate one because that is assuming, so let's say this is the oxide and this is your gate. You're assuming all the impurities are at the very bottom, right? Because then this is T ox, then epsilon ox by T ox is C ox, but they're actually spread all over, right? So, so if you're using this equation, this should be Q impure dash in the sense you're finding out effective impurity. Right, so they they do that through empirical ways. So they'll measure it and they'll say, assume that it's a Q impurity at the near the channel, but in reality they're actually spread over. So they'll basically say statistically they're spread over, but they'll you can model it as like Q impurity right near the channel. Okay, so that's uh, 
Okay, so the mass capacitance. So now if you um, take this sandwich and you apply the voltage and you look at the capacitance, right? Till VT, you're not going to get anything, right? Well, ideally, you're slowly starting getting charge, but assume VT, you're not getting anything. And then after VT, the, the charge on the plates are going to increase at a slope, which is the slope of this C ox times the area of this whole cap. So whatever is this area of this, so let's say this is L, this is W. So C ox times W times L is the total cap. And so the charge is going to vary across. So normal linear cap, it would have looked like this, but um, uh, in case of a MOS cap, because the channel doesn't turn on till you have inverted the cap. So it is going to look like this, right? But before that you actually have a cap, which is the depletion cap and that's what this is. And so that, but the depletion cap is much smaller than C ox because you have two caps in series, right? You have C ox and C dep in series, right? C ox and C dep. And this looks like a parallel resistor, right? So the effective resistance capacitance looks like C ox times C dep over C ox plus C dep. So if your C dep is really, really small, then this whole quantity is also very small, just like a resistor, but in resistor it's parallel. Here it is in series, right? A kind of reciprocal. Okay, that's how you calculate the charge. All right, so here I'm going to show from a charge perspective, like how to get the VT. So um, if you just had the metal oxide semiconductor, like I said, you're going to form a channel based on uh, the, the polysilicon as N plus with uh, 10 to the power 19 per centimeter cube and semiconductor with 10 to the power 14 centimeter cube and oxide of whatever thickness, right? So if you took that sandwich, uh, you're going to form a, channel based on our last equation, right? Because it was minus 0.25, which means the channel will be formed already, right? So then what you do is you, so the flat band voltage is apply a voltage to remove that, right? So you bring it back to like, as if all these three were just kind of separated. So that's your flat band voltage. Then you apply the um, voltage it is required here for that Q depletion, right? Q depletion here. And this voltage difference from here to here, Q depletion should be two fire, right? If you apply that, then the channel is formed right at that point. And after that, the channel charge forms as if it is looks like a capacitor, right? So delta Q uh, times delta C, I mean, C ox will be your delta V. So if you apply delta V, delta Q will change by delta V by C ox, right? So, and that charge is just formed right here. And then you, that Q impurity, I was saying, like, for example, you have some trap charges at the surface and then you have some uh, spread around. You combine all that charges like effective charge divided by C ox. You apply that voltage to first overcome that as well. And then this total voltage is your threshold voltage to turn the channel on, okay? So this is another way of looking at it. Now, from a band gap perspective, if you're looking at it, the moment you do this sandwich, right? The bands are going to bend based on the thermodynamics where we said that all the Fermi levels have to be same. So all the Fermi level has to be, I mean, the total Fermi level through the sandwich has to be same, but the, all the work functions are different. So that means the band has to bend to match that, right? So that's what the band bending is. And as you can see that this is, uh, this actually should show, I mean, it's not, uh, maybe I've shown it in the separate one. Yeah, so this is not, so in the previous example, which showed this band actually bends all the way this side because it looks like a, I'm sorry, no, not, uh, it's a EC, sorry, it's the other way around. So the example we took, the band actually bends this way. No, no, sir. Uh, no, no, it's correct. So, because this is the Fermi level, so the band, band bends even further, right? So if I look at, uh, okay, so let's take this. So like, for example, it's even, even more. So basically if I look at this sandwich here, the Fermi level looks closer to EC, right? Because now your um, Fermi level is close to the conduction band and it's because it's already inverted. It looks like an type, right? So when I join them together, the band bends so much that it actually gets inverted. 
right? So then you apply that uh, flat band voltage and that's why it's called flat band voltage because you now you actually apply the voltage so that the bands become flat, right? And, um, and that's your flat band voltage. And then you go back and bend it the other way around, right? So it's kind of, because from the circuit we had shown before. And uh, so you bend it. Okay, so this is why it's it's uh, two phi f because you had some uh, work function which had made it a n type, right? I mean a p type, which was phi f below the Fermi level, right? Now here, in order to uh, invert this, so if I take this sandwich and kind of look at the EC Fermi level, and um, I'm sorry. Yeah, the total Fermi level. And uh, I mean, the Fermi level of the sandwich, this is EF, uh, yeah, EF, Close to conduction. yeah, P, this was your earlier one. And this is your EV, this is your EC. So basically I'm, what I've taken is I've taken this small slice and uh, blown it up. And this is now, if it is equal to phi f, then this will look like almost like the same um, n type, just like the p type, but it's inverted now, right? So that's why it's two phi f because you're taking a p type phi f and you're bending it another phi f on this side so that it almost looks like a similar n type, right? So that's why the difference is two phi f. And that's the reason why you need that surface potential to be two phi f because the p type was phi f below the Fermi level, okay, the effective Fermi level. Now it needs to be above phi f below it. So that differential is to phi f, okay, magnitude of to phi f. Okay, kind of makes sense? All right. Yeah, at least understand just the basics. Yeah. So this is, yeah. Sir, in, ahead, depletion, uh, sir, in depletion mode, mm -hmm. the uh, charges near the oxide and semiconductor boundary are movable or immovable? Uh, charges near the oxide and semiconductor interface. Yeah, but it is it is an addition of both. So basically, Subham is asking, uh, you have a depletion mode here. Uh, the charges near the surface is it movable or not? Well, the depleted charges are not movable. It doesn't matter if it is close to the oxide or it is away from the oxide. It is a depleted. It's fixed charge. They are not going to move. But on top of that, you get mobile charges once it's inverted, and those are the movable charges if you apply a voltage. Okay. Did I answer your question? Yes, sir. Okay. All right, so makes sense so far. So we kind of saw it in three different ways how to get that channel inverted, right? So one uh, like charge, yeah? Sir, in uh, then I, I'm not getting uh, how the depletion mode is working. How the depletion mode uh, device so, so hold on, hold on. Are you asking about the depletion charges or a depletion mode transistor? Depletion mode transistor. Okay, so what's your question? I thought you were asking about depletion charges. What's sir, the question about depletion? Sir, in the depletion mode, the charges near the oxide and semiconductor interface are, are fixed. Uh, that means... No, 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 no. You're confusing, Roy. You're confusing two things. A depletion mode transistor has nothing to do with the depletion charges as their channel charge. You got it, right? The channels are still getting inverted at near the surface. It's just called a depletion mode transistor. That's all. Got it? Yeah, enhanced okay. mode transistor also has the same amount of depletion mode uh, charges, but your VT is positive. Okay, so don't confuse between depletion charges and depletion mode transistor. Okay, so depletion mode transistor still has free charges, so still it is inverted. So in depletion mode transistor, this band bending happens without you applying any voltage across it. And it is inverted and you get fixed charges at the charge, at the interface and it starts moving. But you have the depletion charges also there, they're just not moving, they're fixed. And in enhancement mode transistor, you also have those depletion charges, they're still not moving, just that you have, a, you have added some more charges to make the VT artificially high so that the channel charge appears at a higher uh, VT voltages. Got it? Yes, sir. Okay. So let's move. I mean, we can take this offline if you have, because we have, uh, you know, we just want to go through this material. We have still more left. Okay, so the body effect is, um, 
so when you um, so if you have let's say now the drain source the bulk everything is grounded so now we were looking only at the um, oxide uh, the gate oxide and the substrate sandwich right but that's just a capacitor it's still not a device we can use as a transistor right in order to do use it as a transistor now we uh, add this n plus uh, source and drains right because we add n plus source and drains because there are enough negative charges so what happens is when your channel inverts then applying electric field will make the electrons move in other because if i put a p plus then p plus doesn't have electrons so i can't provide electrons to move from i mean it is there in the channel but i have to move it from the channel to the p plus and then move it through the battery right if i have p plus then there are no negative charges so they're not going to move into the p plus area so now that's why i need the n plus i need n plus because it has majority electrons in it so in p must the opposite right because my inverted channel is holes i need those two reasons to have more holes in it so that i can go uh, majority carriers from the channel to the p plus back to the battery and so on or wherever you are flowing it through right so i apply the source and drain and um, if i so and the source and drain basically uh, now once the channel is inverted this looks like a short basically right it's like a metal sheet between source and drain so whatever your source and drain voltages are that's your sheet channel voltage 2 right and then you apply vgs equal to vt i mean the channel is formed there but there is no current flowing because the drain and source voltage is the same so there is just charge so it's still looking like a capacitor between gate and source drain bulk because they're all shorted together right so basically your your transistor is kind of looking like this so everything is shorted bulk this is all grounded and that's your vg so it's still a capacitor right you're not applying the voltage between drain and source for it to conduct current now what you do is you uh, apply uh, a source voltage which is higher than the bulk voltage okay when you do that then the depletion increases in this direction what that does is it increases your effective vt also okay and i think we had like a one hour discussion during puneet's course this year but just kind of remember it this way actually i'll i'll be showing di bill through the band diagram i think it will be more clear uh, through that but just imagine it this way is that see you have you have a potential here right and you need a potential difference of vt to turn the channel on you increase this voltage now i need to increase the gate voltage by some amount now you might say oh just increase it by the same amount vsb right but the relationship between from vg to the surface potential is not linear right it follows that v ox times vib we did that qb equation so it's a non linear equation right so we have to find that change in phi s using that equation and we'll say add that amount of voltage back to the gate to bring that surface potential back to where it was like phi s then it will go on you got it right so the the definition of vt is what should be phi s and here what's happening is once i move vsb by certain amount that phi s is changing by certain amount and how much is that phi s changing by well i know how much this qb is i can apply the pn junction theory and figure out how much phi s it is changed by what is the potential because i'll apply the poisson equation and everything but i already have equation for it and if i know that value i would say apply that value back in vt i mean vg to get me back to 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 that value of phi s right so the key is basically saying that what what is the delta v i need on the gate for me to bring the surface potential back to where it was before i applied that vsp okay so that's that's how and if you do that that calculation basically you and so this was your previous calculation vt0 vt0 means the vsp works to zero so that had that uh you know qb over c ox v flat band plus 2 vf plus q impurity over c ox and all that term plus now you get this term and that comes from the pn junction theory basically it's telling you what is that delta v i need to bring that fs back to where it needs right uh, or in simpler term basically all, all you're doing is you're saying whatever the change in value of the qb was if i can apply this voltage back to make it back to that same qb then i my fs should be the same because from pn junction i know that fs and qb are related so it should be the same so you're kind of doing this indirectly but 
it is not entirely true it is an approximation because you have effect of the depletion but it is a pretty good approximation for first level uh, level 1 so that's why it's called level 1 modeling so the error you get is minimal so then you use the bsim 3v through which takes all the effect takes the depletion effect also and tells you what the change in vt is okay and that change in um uh, vt is this value so in other words if you have a nmos right so you, typically the source and um uh, bulk are grounded you're going to get vt 0 now let's say the sorry now let's say the source is you put the source at some vcsb and the bulk is still zero right then the vt is going to be a higher value now by this this amount okay so if your source is going higher vt is also going higher okay just remember that okay and that term um, that uh, and this is a uh, process it's a it's a those values are you can see it's a epsilon s the amount of doping c ox and q times right of that so that's term and this term is so if your vsb equals to 0 then this becomes 0 and you're back to vt 0 if your vsb is a positive value then your vt is a higher value by this delta v term got it okay so just remember that and for pmos it's the opposite right so pmos if your source value is decreasing your vtp goes negative higher by amount this much right because it's a negative value for vtp so the, it'll be a higher negative value if your source voltage is decreasing here your source voltage is increasing there the source voltage is decreasing right because it's kind of inverted make sense everyone chandan shubham and uh, abhinav yes, any sir. questions on yes, this sir. one okay good all right so now uh, we'll uh, quickly look at the iv characteristics um, <clears throat> so before i and this i showed you guys during uh, punis course so i'll just maybe just kind of quickly um just explain it what it is and then so basically this is if you just have a block of semiconductor or any conductor it's just showing you how to derive the current equations from it right it's actually your resistance uh, of that material um so essentially what you're doing is you're taking a small slice of that material and you're trying to figure out how much charge is flowing through it per unit time right so that's the key so in order to find out you find out first of all given the voltage difference you find out the electric field through it and that electric field times the um basically this quantity here the the mobility times the electric field will give you the velocity of each electron traveling through that once you know the density of the electron through that surface area times that electric field it will give you the velocity and that give you the dq over dt and that's how you find out the current right so this is basically doing that calculation and once you do that calculation you'll find out that is actually uh, your resistance equation right so basically it's a uh, uh, v times i is this sheet rho times l over w right that's how you calculate your resistance and the sheet rho is 1 over qs mu so whatever is your surface charge so it's inversely proportional to surface charge because if your surface charge is increasing then the current is increasing i mean this is the resistance value right so the current is inversely proportional to that same thing with mu if you have a higher mobility you have more current that means the resistance is decreasing so that makes change and l over w obviously makes change because if your l is increasing it takes more time to get to one point to another point and it looks like a higher resistance if your w is increasing then your charge density is increasing that's why your resistance is decreasing and obviously the height is not taken into picture because that's fixed so that's why you always talk about sheet charges instead of volume charge okay so that's because we use it to derive the current equation for the first one so in the first one where we do is we turn the channel on and we are applying a very small voltage so the very small voltage appears like a sheet charge like before so it looks like a block of resistive material or a conductive material and we just apply the previous uh, equation we derived except that the channel kind of uh, the qs the charge here is formed by that equation cox vgs minus vt because before that the channel charges are not formed right and then uh, if you apply that previous equation uh, of the resistance equation and you substitute it here 
then you get that first equation for your channel charge which is that voltage dependent um, resistance equation so if your vds is really small and we'll see when we derive the quadratic equation if you take the vds really small the square term you make it to zero then it will turn out to be this equation right because now this term is, this is a linear equation right because it's a linear re re relation between ids and vds right so with a given vgs basically uh, and that's this is your resistance value where it is also dependent on your gate value. So the higher the gate value, the higher the current, the rest the resistance. But your VDS has to be small. And this is actually in analog we use that. So wherever you can use this uh, fairly nonlinear resistor with small value, we use that to do a con voltage control resistor. Okay. And if this VDS is uh, larger, then um, we do what's called gradual channel. So the currents you're uh, deriving, it's what's called gradual channel approximation. And uh, what gradual channel approximation means is that you're assuming there is no longitudinal electric field change. So you're just taking VD divided by L, that's your constant electric field. And you're assuming that the vertical electric field, they don't change VT and the VTs are almost constant throughout, which is not the case because you're assuming the depletion is constant throughout, which is not the case once you, apply because you can see this side on the higher side, this depletion is thicker than this side. That actually changes the VTs around here, but you make that approximation to make your equation simpler, okay? So that's what the level one equation is, that assumes that. And it's the same thing again. You actually, now because your voltage is varying throughout the channel, you take one slice of the, the, the voltage and you apply the same theory as before. So you say this small channel slice, how much current is flowing through it, okay? So you take a delta L and your QY, which is the channel charge density at that point is equal to VGS minus VC at that channel, which is kind of linearly varying throughout the channel. That's your assumption. Minus VT0 minus QC. But like I said, gradual. this is the gradual channel approximation where you're saying throughout the channel, the VT remains constant, but that's not true but it's a, it's a pretty good approximation, right? So you do that, now integrate it from zero to L, and that's what gives you that, um, this equation, the equation you, are, you guys are used to. Okay. So that's, that's your linear mode equation, right? Linear mode equation where you get mu and C ox by two, W over L, two times VGS minus VT, VDS, or you know, a lot of times people write it, VGS minus VT times VDS, VDS square over two. <clears throat> so, and you can see here for very small VDS, if you neglect this term over here, then this turns to be the previous equation, right? The one we derived just doing a simple um, uh, drift equation. And all this is drift, there is no diffusion. We are not assuming there is any diffusion because these are carriers, free carriers moving because of the electric field. If there were uh, charge density is changing because of combination and recombination inside a, uh, a semiconductor. That would be the diffusion equation, but we are assuming that part is very small. But that's the main equation for subthreshold, so which is VG less than VT. So we've always assumed VG less than VT. The channel is off. Actually, it's not. In fact, in low power, we'll all. So when you will, when you'll start designing op amps for this project. Uh, either for the SAR ADC or your, um, uh, this thing, uh, what do you call it, sigma delta, uh, you'll actually bias the input transistors in subthreshold, means your VG will be less than VT. Because that's where you get the best uh, power metric. Power metric in the sense for a given power, the highest conduction, transconduction is actually in that year. And I'll show you a graph uh, in the end or maybe it's in that other, other slides, I'll show you, okay? So that's the linear equation. And then if you keep increasing this VDS, you get to a point where the uh, at the drain end, the channel pinches off, right? Because your channel density is decreasing as your voltage is increasing in the channel because it's VGS minus VD, VC minus VT and the VC is increasing. So you reached a point, your VDS, which is VGS minus VT, that point, the channel at that very end becomes zero and it pinches off, right? And so basically the first question everyone asks is if there is no channel, how are you transporting charge? 
Well, that's purely high electric field, exactly. So because it's a small region and you still have a high electric field and the depletion area, like I just said, it looks like an uh, oxide, but if you put a charge, it just passes it through, right? So you cannot have static mobile charges there, but the charges can flow through it. And that's the mechanism, but it is a constant. It's a constant electric, because now your channel charge is not varying. If your channel charge is not varying, then your current is constant, right? So basically, if you took your previous equation and you made the VDS higher and higher, you'll actually see that the current is decreasing. But this region is, is bogus, right? Because that application, that equation doesn't apply here. So what you do is you say, okay, I take the equation till this point, which is VGS minus V. And then I say, at this point, I make the VDS equals to VGS minus VT and fix it. And I make the current constant from here onwards. Okay. So that's your uh, thing. And that's how this, that uh, linear equation current turns out to be this because you make your VDS equals to VGS minus VT and make it constant. Okay. So this is your saturation current mode where VGS is greater than VT, channel is formed, VDS is equal to VGS minus VT or greater than VGS minus VT in NMOS. In PMOS, all these things gets inverted, right? But in reality, um, this current actually ever so slightly increases. That's because that depletion area as you're increasing the voltage is slightly decreasing. So it looks like as if your effective channel is decreasing. So which means that in your ID equation, right? In your ID equation, you have W over L. This L dash seems like it is decreasing slightly because that pinch off region is increasing. So your effective channel length seems like decreasing. So your overall current seems like increasing, right? So that's this thing. So in this region, your ID was what? Is equal to mu N C ox W over L VGS minus VT. I mean, approximately equal to times VDS, right? That's the linear equation. If you go above this, but before the saturation area, so this is mu n C ox W over L uh, two times VGS minus VT plus or minus plus VDS square. That's your equation, right? And then once you reach above VGS minus VT, it becomes constant. IDS is equal to mu n C ox over two W over L uh, VGS minus VT whole square, right? But then we said, actually it's not constant, it varies. And that is in level one approximated by empirical formula, which is called one over Lambda VDS, right? And this Lambda is called the channel and modulation constant, which tells you how much current is varying. And then when you start doing analog, um, in fact, next class, what we'll do is we'll take the inverter and make it an amplifier. And that you'll see how that lambda decides your gain, okay? Because the higher the slope, the lower the gain. The lower the slope, higher the gain. Because a small change in voltage, a large change in current, large change in current also gives you a large change in voltage at the output, okay? So that lambda actually decides your voltage gain. And we'll see in that, uh, and that uh, is what decides your, what's called your output impedance, small signal output impedance, okay? So we'll do that in the next class when we introduce small signal model using an inverter as an amplifier. Um, that'll introduce the small signal com concept and it'll also show you how that output impedance is the key for amplification, okay? So that's your equation for uh, your saturation region right now, okay? So just remember that. Okay, so subthreshold current, uh, sir, like I said, yeah, go ahead, Subham. Uh, sir, after my saturation region, if I keep increasing my gate voltage, then what will happen? No, no, this is with constant gate voltage. If you're increasing the gate voltage, then this current is increasing, right? So, so this sir, current is also channel increasing. Length? So the... Is there any change in... Is there any change in channel length? No, yes, there will channel... Yeah, because if you increase the gate voltage, then the channel where it pinches off, now it's going to change, right? So you just apply the same thing, VGS minus VT, right? So your saturation point was at VDS equal to VGS minus VT, right? Yes, sir. VDS equal to VGS minus VT, right? And let's say this was, VGS was five volt, VT was uh, one volt, 
and um, so your VDS is one volt, right? At one volt, it will become saturation. Now you're saying I, I increase my VGS to six volts, then this will be two volts, right? At two volts, this will go into saturation. That's where it will get pinched off. Yes, sir. Okay. Uh, sir, I read right, so somewhere that. Sir, I read yeah. that uh, uh, the the number of charges, number of charge carriers near the uh, interface is equal to the number of charges in the bulk. Number of negative charges, uh, I mean. Negro, uh, the amount of charges at the interface is equal to what? Uh, number of uh, positive charges in the bulk. No, that's wrong. I mean. I mean, whatever you read, they might have meant something else. I don't know what you mean. So, for example, if this is the oxide, you're saying whatever charges you have here is equal to the same charges as the bulk. No, that's not. I mean, that's not even nearly true, right? This this inverted charge is way way higher than this. That's why your C ox and C dep values are so much different, right? C dep is very very small because of that. Is that what you're talking about, or what are you talking about? Yes, sir. Uh, so they are saying that Na into Nd equal to Na square. So don't, don't just say equations. What, what are you physically talking about? What, what, what Na Nd square? What are you talking about? The inverted charges, or what are you talking about? Yes, sir. Inverted charges. Yes, uh, yes, sir. The number of inverted okay. charges. So yeah. So inverted charges is this, right? C ox times. VGS minus VT. This is the number of inverted charges, right? That's QI. Q depth is just before the inverted charges, whatever is was that, right? That's 2Q epsilon, blah, blah, ND, this. But this is a much smaller amount. At VGS equal to VT zero when it is closed, yes, of course. But once you start increasing the VGS, the, the, the charges increases quite a bit. But so, but wh what is the point? What, I mean, what are you trying to get at? Let's say uh, they are uh, equal at uh, some point. So what is the point? Uh, so I'm saying that uh, uh, when after my saturation po region, um, saturation point, if I am increasing VGS, so there will be less charges available so for the channel formation. No. Um, so you're saying your channel, so, so you reach saturation here, right? And yes, you're sir. saying you increase VGS, right? Yes, sir. Okay. The channel channel has to increase. Otherwise, how will the current increase? Well, but I have limited charges now. Where do you have limited charges? Because law of mass action limits the number of charges. But law of mass action, why are you talking about law of mass action? Law of mass action just tells you um, for a given value of phi i, what your phi, I mean the potential, what your charges will be. But that's what the inverted charges are. You got it, right? Once your channel is inverted, you're only limited by how much voltage you can give at the top. Because the law of mass action, what charges it gives you, your charges are way less than that. You got it. Unless you haven't doped it properly. You see what I'm saying? So this QI, C ox times VGS minus VT, right? If you take the surface potential, sorry, surface potential and calculate the amount of charges you'll have, that is way more than this. It's just that you don't have enough voltage to invert that channel to that much. You got it, right? So in, in band diagram term, you have, uh, you have energy levels which are valid, but they're just not occupied. But once you apply the voltage, they get occupied and you have the charges. Unless you've doped it in such a way that you know the channels are not forming, but that's not how you'll dope, right? If you're making a transistor, you want the, as the VGS increases, then the channel charge should increase. Yes, sir. Okay, so, uh, okay, coming back to subthreshold. So subthreshold, so this is by the way, VGS, this is not VDS, VGS and your current, and this is log current, right? So if you did linear, this would look something like this, right? In square and in saturated, I mean the linear current. So 
basically what this is showing is if you take um so what we have been assuming is that as we um as the vgs is less than vt so let's say the vt was 0.5 right the current is zero right so so far we've been saying that this current is basically just goes to zero but in reality it doesn't go to zero like that it goes to zero in this fashion and this whole current is the diffusion current because the channel hasn't been formed yet actually it is formed but it is a tiny amount so majority of the current is diffusion so it is a small current but as you can see this slope is very high okay compared to this now why does that matter when you're making an amplifier you want the rate of change of the output current to the rate of change of the gate voltage to be very high now it cannot supply a lot of current so if you have a lot of a small load a small resistance it can so you have to make a huge device but if i'm doing low power stuff where the load is very very small and i want to consume as low as possible but get the highest gain as possible that's where you operate that's what you'll see that when we start building the op amp if you're not worried about power and speed you know you don't need a lot of speed out of that then you want to operate here because you'll get a lot of gain with very little amount of current so for all the low power device you'll see that's why they're formed they're, they're biased in sub threshold so in other words your vgs will be actually less than vt but it'll be fine it'll be operating as amplifier so like all the amplifiers i designed like 95% of the time um i i put them in sub threshold because the speed i require i can get it using sub threshold it's only when you start operating in 2 gigahertz 4 gigahertz for a let's say 180 nanometer that's when you have to start operating it in saturation mode okay and i'll show you some equations how to figure out uh, if a um, because just the vgs minus vt is not a good term so you uh, to figure out if it is not only figure out but actually telling how deep you are in sub threshold how deep you are not in sub threshold or saturation there is a nice equation i mean there's a nice uh, metric for it okay so the gm over id metric uh, so when we introduce you to small signal then i'll show you how to and that's something which is nice actually it Im improves your design capability quite a bit which i am always almost shocked that most of the designers especially analog designers don't use that metric to design because uh, otherwise you just make your design efficiency very low okay so so that's sub threshold so sub threshold basically tells you the current absolute current is low but it is not zero but the rate of current change for rate of voltage change is actually much higher than you are in saturation or linear which helps you for some of the analog ones i think i'm going to just skip this um these are just the equations what we have derived so far i think everyone knows p mos like i said they just all get inverted vt is negative vgs is negative vds is negative if you are ever getting confused take the modulus of all that take absolute value and treat it as like n mos right so if you take absolute vgs of um a p mos should be less than absolute v, uh, vt of p mos vtp and absolute vds should be higher than absolute vgs minus vt okay so if you are getting confused like initially when i was starting to design i used to always get confused so i said just like okay just take absolute but if you are publishing paper or writing a report or something like that you should write it this way you know it's like a little bit more i think everyone knows uh quick view i think we can skip this okay so the last thing i want to cover is the mos capacitance um i think everyone is kind of clear about the diffusion cap the mos the oxide caps right so i'm i think i'll just show you how they're voltage dependent okay and um so if you if you just take the cap where the channel is not formed right so that cap is basically from oxide all the way to the bulk so say that again said some yeah so it's basically so if i apply a voltage here this vg it appears across this and this is actually two caps in series like i said right c ox in series with c dep right and that's your uh, gate to bulk that's the cap this cap you're showing right so you can see as your uh, gate voltage is increasing the cap is actually decreasing because and this is where the uh, channel gets inverted and then you get the cgs cap right this is the cap. i think this uh, this graph is probably wrong in kang right 
in that gang. Yeah, so gang, I think, shows you as Seox. It's not Seox there. Okay, so it's only Seox after the channel is formed and inverted. So just make sure you're clear about that. Now, once the channel is formed and it is in linear region, right? Because you're presenting the gate to bulk cap now as two different caps, right? CGS and CGD. So what you do is you kind of divide them into half half on both sides, right? So that's why it looks half CGS. So CGD, CGD looks half CGS, CGS looks half CGS. Okay, this is in linear region. If you're in saturation region, then uh, this cap here, uh, there is a small cap, this overlap cap, okay. So there is the C overlap is basically C ox times uh, C ox times W times that L overlap, right? Because it's not perfect when, when you anneal the, the source kind of diffuses a little bit underneath it. So that's overlap cap. So when you go into saturation, so this is not half CG, but this is this plus C overlap also, two C overlap, right? But that's a tiny amount compared to the source. So when you go into saturation, then CGD becomes just C overlap, right? C overlap times W times L times C ox. I'm just neglecting that. And then this part becomes two by three of two by three C ox times W times L. So whatever was your total cap oxide, the oxide is two times three. So why is it two times three? It's a little bit involved. It's called the partition theorem. You have to look into some of the device physics and see it, but uh, it's a little bit, you know, there's, at least I don't have intuitive answer for it. It's just that now your channel is pinched off. You know, intuitively it looks like, oh, it should have been just equal to almost equal to C ox times W times L because this region we said it's very small, but the oxide cap towards the depletion actually cancels some of the oxide ones. And that's what you have to look into that partition theorem to figure out what it is. Okay. So so the, the CGS and CGD, the, they can vary with the gate, uh, the regions of operations, right? So in cutoff, obviously the, the CGS and CGD is just C overlap because there's no channel. So you just have this tiny C overlap. So that's the only uh, capacitor. And the, from gate to bulk, it is the series cap of the oxide and the depletion cap. And then once the channel is formed, the gate to bulk, you don't get any cap, right? Because, because there is no, there is no one-to-one -one charge between bulk and this thing. There is a little bit, but it's very small. And then once you go into linear, then it's almost half-half. Once you go into saturation, then two-third goes into CGS, none goes to the drain. Okay, and I've just shown another 3D picture of the same diagram. And when you are calculating um, uh, this, uh, so typically um, they will give you, the models will give you what is the unit cap per unit length on the sidewalls and they'll give you a unit area, cap per unit area for the bottom plate. So usually they'll call it a CJ uh, sidewall plus CJS, I think bottom or something like that. And this times W times L and this will, um, let me just show the whole thing. So if you want to calculate, uh, so let's say this is L diffusion. This is the length of the diffusion, right? And this is obviously W, right? W of the transistor. So if you have to calculate this uh, capacitance, so usually they'll give you two capacitance values, the processing or the technology guys, the CJ sidewall. And this will be two times LD plus two times W times that, basically the perimeter, okay? But actually it's, just usually times W because this cap, because there is a source drain, they do something called like halo implant. So it's different. So usually it's two LD plus W times the sidewall. And then CJS, I think, or CJSB, that's the bottom bottom part of the, so if you imagine this room and that's your like the top connection, then the bottom plate is W times LD. And then the three perimeters are the sidewalls, right? So that's what. So this will be W times LD. So that's your total uh, CJ, what do they call it? C, C, D, C, S, B or C, D, B. Okay, and this is a diffusion nonlinear cap. Okay, all right, makes sense. Everyone clear? Any questions from people calling in, Shubham? 
Chandan and Abhinav, clear about this? Yes, sir. Okay. Yes, sir. Good. All right. So I think that's all I have. So I'll uh, just quickly go through some short channel effects and then we can wrap this up. I'll just continue the uh, recording for the short channel because that's not very big. Okay, so all we have done so far is what's called long channel approximate, not only long channel, long width also. Okay, and, um, but most of your devices starting, I don't know, I think quarter micron, maybe two, 250 nanometer, uh, all these approximations, you know, this kind of start to fall apart. Like, you know, your overall equations are still the same, but, uh, you know, secondary effect starts uh, coming up. And especially once you get down to like 65 nanometer, 28 nanometer and all that, then your square law and all that, you know, the errors are huge. It's still good for hand calculation. You can still do hand calculations to just get you, but your error between your simulation and your hand calculation using those equations, you'll see they're going farther away compared to like 180 nanometer, 130 nanometer and so on. Okay. And, uh, so what are the assumptions in this? One of the assumptions is your longitudinal field, uh, the variation is, uh, is low. Basically it's saying that you have VDS, then you get electric field, which is uh, VDS divided by L. That's your electric field, which is constant, but that's not true. At short channel, what happens? Uh, so what I should say is long channel, thick oxide approximation. So this is assuming, it's a long channel and the oxide is thick so that electric field, vertical electric field effects are low. But now what's happening is the channel is getting shorter, your thin oxide is also getting uh, thinner and the wide, you know, so everywhere it's getting compressed, right? So, so that's one of the approximation is that the electric field is constant and almost same and there is no effect of the vertical electric field. So you calculate VT, after you calculate VT, you just throw that away, right? So in ca calculation of the VT, you take only vertical electric field. You don't assume there is any longitudinal field, right? So that's also an approximation. Once you're done with the VT, you throw that away and then you just take the approximation in the longitudinal direction, okay? But they're all affected all the time. So VT is affected by the longitudinal field, the current is affected by the vertical field and so on, right? So, um, and the current is not affected when the drain voltage is above saturation. In the sense we say, when we make the VDS higher than VGS minus VT, just follows the one plus lambda VDS. But that's not true for this thing because you start getting really high electric field and that tends to have effects, which uh, I'll kind of qualitatively show you quickly what they are. And the channel is long and wide that you're assuming that if I just take a slice somewhere, it looks like a 1D, there's no effect of the edges, but that's not true. And the gate oxide is a perfect insulator. It is not because, um, you know, 65 nanometer onwards, even 90 nanometers, you actually have gate currents because of the quantum effect, because, you know, it's a probability, it's a, it's a barrier, right? The insulator is a barrier, but it is a probability function. You know, it's a quantum mechanics probability function. But if that oxide is really thick, you know, your, your Gaussian curve, like it thins down. So by the time you find the electron charge density, it is like almost zero. So basically what I mean is this. So you have, uh, you have a barrier, right? So this is your gate side, this is your bulk side, and this is your oxide. So essentially what it is looking something like this, that's the probability of, you know, finding electron, right? Now this is oxide, even if there is a probability of finding electron, it's not occupied because there's oxide there. But here there is a probability of finding electron and it is a semiconductor, the electrons will come in because there are charges, right? But when the oxide is really thick, this is like almost zero. But as soon as you make the oxide thinner and thinner, you can see this probability is now much higher. So what it means is that you have electrons flowing through the gate. Okay, the barrier is not high enough. 
Okay, so that's the quantum tunneling effect, which they talk about. So when you get to 65, 28, seven nanometer, these are huge gate currents. So that's why the power is an issue because you have a gate current issue right now. Okay, so that's what it means. And yeah, so gate substrate current is zero. That's what you assume, we've been assuming so far, but in this small channel, thin oxide devices, that's not true anymore. Okay, so the so like I said, there are many effects. So what I'll do is, you know, for the sake of like, you know, interviews and all that, most of the time they'll they'll ask you the common ones. So I'll just go through qualitatively what the common ones are, and then at least know them qualitatively. Uh, if somebody asks you, at least you should know. So so the first effect of the the short channel is the velocity saturation. So when we did the IDS calculations, you know, we use this equation, right? So V D equals to mu times Ex. So, which means that if I keep increasing the VDS, the electric field increases, and mu is constant, so VD will keep increasing. In other words, the 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 velocity of the electron will keep increasing. If the velocity is increasing, then the delta Q per delta T for that surface area will increase. Your current will keep increasing, right? But for short channel, that's not true because what happens is the electric field, the vertical ones, are so high that after some time the velocity of the electron saturates. So that's what is shown here. So this is what we have been assuming, that the velocity just linearly keeps increasing, but it actually saturates, okay? And um, if you look at typical values, the saturation values are about 10 to the power four volt per centimeter for electrons, three into 10 to the power four. So basically 10 kilovolt per centimeter uh, for electron and holes. And if you look at this uh, velocity, they're about 18 to 10 to the power six centimeter per second, okay? Um, and this is typically a kind of a simple, simplistic model you can use for VD. So you basically use this VD max times this uh, 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 critical electric field. And the critical electric field is defined as wherever these two lin lines intersect. So whatever is your VD max and whatever was this linear curve, that you defined as the, the critical electric field. That means beyond which the velocity will start saturating. So that's what's called. But obviously it's not like, you know, increasing linearly and boom, right? It follows this uh, kind of parabolic curve because it slowly starts saturating. But that's the definition of the critical electric field. And the current, um, you know, if you take the linear equation, in uh, the velocity saturation equ equation will obviously have W over L. It has the same uh, effect of VDS and VGS, but what you see is that the mu is not mu anymore. It's a mu effective term, and that mu effective gets, uh, gets lower and lower as your V effective is getting higher and higher. So in other words, if you keep increasing the gate voltage, the effective mu starts coming down. And on top of that, this denominator is not one, but it's one plus VDS over this critical field times L, which means that as your VDS is increasing, then your current is also decreasing. So in other words, what it means is your device saturates faster. So it's not equal to VGS minus VT anymore. It actually starts saturating earlier and less current than your what you had calculated before because of this term here. Okay, so that's the main uh, sort of effect of that velocity saturation. Is that makes, uh, makes clear? Okay. Okay, so the other effect is called the drain induced barrier uh, lowering. I think somebody had asked this before, maybe it came on an interview or something, the DI bill, I remember this being asked. Was it like ST? In... ST bra substitution, okay. So maybe the question came up somewhere or whatever. So that's also a channel, um, you know, effect uh, because of uh, uh, vertical field, I mean the horizontal field, okay. So what happens is in a long channel, if I just take, uh, so this, this is a diagram I got from Cividis's book. I thought it explains it nicely. Um, so this, is, so this is the conduction band diagram. So it's just taking the conduction band. It's not showing you the Fermi, not the, the valence or anything like that. Just showing you the energy of the conduction band as you're going from drain to source of a transistor, okay? So in long channel, uh, before the channel is formed, it is this one. So this is VGS minus, uh, VGS 
less than Vt. Okay, so which means that the channel barrier is higher than the drain one, the conduction one. So the electrons can't flow from the drain to source. Okay, and then once it gets to VGS equals to Vt and uh, VGS greater than Vt and VDS is very small, right? If that's the case, then the the conduction band from the source drain to the channel back is almost flat. That means you can almost start conducting current right now. Okay. And then once you start increasing VDS, you know, greater than zero, then the source side obviously remains the same, but the drain starts starts lowering. So that's what's called drain induced barrier lowering because you're lowering the barrier, right? And this potential difference is in favor of your conduction of the current. All right. So you can imagine that you're putting a bucket of water here and it'll just flow. If the slope is higher and higher because the potential is higher, you'll just flow through it, right? Because your electric field is higher. So any electrons over there will just flow nicely, right? And in short channel, what happens is it gets aggravated. So you can see now the short channel is, is, is closer, but because the effect of your drain side diffusion, I mean the source side diffusion, this barrier starts lowering even further. Okay, so that's what's called the drain-induced drain barrier lowering. So it was already low to begin with because that's normal, but with short channel, it lowers even further. Now, if it lowers even further, that means the potential difference is larger. So your current actually increases, okay? So I think I have a graph, yeah. So if you look at the VGS versus ID curves, this is the log curve. You can see as the L is decreasing, this curve is moving more towards, um, higher that means for the same vgs you're getting higher current okay because of that but that has other problems i'll show you that yeah one of the problem is called punch through so punch through is like extreme diabl what it means is that uh, you keep lowering the short channel and you can see this this vgs over id current starts increasing but then what happens is you can see that you can't shut it off anymore so even your vgs is zero there is still current, right? The current keeps going. And the reason for that is your drain and uh, sources are so close that you have high electric field and you have mobile charges, they just punch through, even if the channel is not inverted because the source has channel excess. Uh, so in case of NMOS, the source has electrons, the drain has electrons, there's a huge electric field, they just punch through. Just like in the pinch off region, right you have right at the pinch off you have a lot of electrons obviously a lot of electrons on the other side there's a huge field it just punches through now it happens without any channel because now your entire channel is like the pinch off region because it's so small now it has become like the pinch off region so in a long channel like in quarter micron your pinch off region was like seven nanometer but now your seven nanometer device is seven nanometer right so it's so small that it just punches through so that's the problem with this thing. So they do all sorts of process like halo implant and all that to reduce the short channel effects. And it's amazing because you know the physicists, they claim that after one micron, you, you are going to short channel. All these effects will come into and you can't make normal transistors. Obviously one micron, they blew it by. Then they said, oh, 0.5, you can't do it. Then they said 0.25, you can't do it. Then they said 180, you can't do it. You can't do 130, 90. Now they are three nanometer. <laughs> Okay, so they went from thousand nanometers saying that after thousand you're done. Okay, so my Superman friend whose mother didn't fit in that, he used to always make joke of me. He's like, because he used to do physics then, he said, well, it's all one micron and we have already predicted physicists that it's all going to be quantum. So you'd need our help. So you'll all be, you know, out of job. So, and it's gone from thousand to four nanometer and we are still doing classical design, right? So it's kind of amazing how much they've done in processes to get it going. So this is one effect. And the last one I wanted to show is the hot carrier effect. So what happens um, uh, during this? So you have an electric field even when you don't have charges or when you have charges, right? And now the this lateral electric field is very high, right? Because it's same VDS, it's not same VDS, but the VDS is not scaling along with L. In other words, in long channel, we had a long channel. So let's say the channel length was one micron, right? You had a VDS of five volts, right? If you wanted to keep the same electric field in three nanometer, let's say 10 nanometer, right? You had to bring that five volt by 
100 times, 50 millivolts. But the supply is not 50 millivolts now. The supply is still one volt for those devices. So which means that your 1,000 times or 100 times higher electric field than what the equivalent was in the long channel, right? So that that is creating problems because right now what is happening is, you know the, the breakdown mechanism of diodes, right? In the reverse bias diode. So you have a reverse bias diode, you keep increasing the electric field, then the, the immobile charges which are there, slowly they'll start breaking. And then once they break, they start breaking some lattices, that breaks more and it avalanches, right? That's the avalanche. So that's exactly what happens here. You have a high electric field and they start breaking some of the pairs, right? Some of the lattices which should not be conducting because of normal operation, they start breaking. And the result of that, what happens is your bulk current increases and your drain current actually reduces. And the other effect in analog design, which we have a lot of problem with this uh, hot carrier effect is noise. Your effective thermal noise goes up a uh, lot more than what your 4KTR uh, recommends. So your drain current increases means leakage current increases. So if you have a processor with 10 million devices and you have this tiny leakage current, but tiny leakage current times a million devices is a lot of current, right? So even if all of them powered down, they're still kind of doing this, right? If your gate is still powered down, but if you have a drain source voltage, then you're still going to get some bulk current, okay? So that's the problem, noise is a problem. And sometimes once the uh, reliability, so if you're in a high temperature environment and uh, you, uh, you know, typically in a consumer item, you want to be operating for 10 years. This may not go even for one year, depending on how high electric field you're operating. Okay. So I think that's all uh, for the short channel I wanted to cover. Any, any questions? Guys on the call, any questions? So yeah, just remember the key thing in the short channel is you're assuming that when you are doing current calculations, the vertical field wasn't affecting you, that does. When you are doing VT calculation, you're only taking vertical field, you're not worried about the, uh, the longitudinal field, but that affects. And on top of that, you know, like the depletion region, you assume that the source side depletion and your, uh, this depletion thickness, they didn't affect because they were just so far away. But once you get them close, that so let's say for example, that diffusion length was three nanometer. You know, one micron, that three nanometer, I don't care. I mean, it's like the other end, right? Now in a six nanometer, they're right next to each other, right? So they're three, three plus three, they're six. And then you have punch through because of that, okay? So that's, uh, that's why it's, uh, these effects are problematic. Okay.